instructor um, who is right now at Co uh, Williams College who got his PhD from University of Texas, Austin. Um, and the title of his talk is Language, Ethnicity, and Identity in the Arab World. Um, we have a full hour, but um, we'll talk will be about 40 minutes and then we're gonna have time for questions and comments at the end. Um, and then I will um, have a couple points about the teaching um, all right, thank uh, you. All right, can you all hear me pretty well? All right, thank you so much for the kind introduction, Betty. Um, so today's talk is gonna be about, I'm gonna take you to southern Egypt. We have a wonderful picture here of Aswan that I took. This is where we're gonna be focusing on today. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how I got interested in this project, uh, how this developed and unfolded. So I was a student at the American University of Cairo in 2011, 2012, and I was studying Arabic. And uh, Egypt is actually quite a diverse, ethnically diverse region in the Middle East. So I would meet people from southern Egypt that are Said city in Egypt. I would meet uh, Nubians, meet uh, si people from Siwa Valley, so Siwa or Berber people that speak a different language. And um, as I was studying Arabic, I wanted to understand what uh, a lot of my friends, especially from southern Egypt, were saying because I couldn't really understand it. So that's how it developed for me was from a learner's perspective. And some of the questions that arose, I noticed is there was variation uh, based on ethnicity in southern Egypt. Um, so how was ethnicity playing out in the linguistic variation? This is a question I had as I was going about doing my field work. I would even go do uh, trips down from Cairo to Aswan basically every weekend and uh, to kind of hash out these issues. Okay, so again, where are we talking about? We're talking about uh, Aswan. So Aswan, this is a map of Egypt. It's in north um, eastern Africa, as you can see in the little box there. Along the Nile, okay, so Egypt's a desert. People only live on the, the banks of the Nile, mostly and in some valleys. See what valley is about right there, what I was talking about earlier. But Aswan is uh, southern Egypt. This is where uh, I did my research and okay so before uh, we go into the talk I want to provide you with an overview of some of the, the themes that I would like to uh, emphasize as we go forward so um, I'm interested in how again ethnic identity one's ethnic identity uh, affects pronunciation in Arabic because in Arabic we usually associate that with mother tongue so somebody is Nubian it's Nub they speak Nubian they wouldn't speak Arabic with a Nubian accent. So this is a question we're going to be coming back to. And then we're going to be looking at one socio-phonetic variable. Um, so it's a consonant. It's called uh, ta. So if you will with me, this is a word in Arabic. It's called taba. So taba, taba, taba means ball. That's how you say it, ta. Um, that's the sound we're looking at. Um, pharyngealized T for us linguists between parentheses. Um, and I'm also interested in how the results of this study uh, can inspire potential collaborative projects, potential, uh, you know, grant work, et cetera. Okay. Um, so as we know, uh, one's ethnic identity can uh, influence your pronunciation choice in English. So an example of that, it's uh, common in Southern California, is Chicano English. So uh, it's like speaking English with a Spanish accent, but it's not like a foreign language accent. It's not like somebody speaking, um, bringing like a, an, like a Spanish speaker bringing an accent with them. It's for identity purposes. It's to emphasize your identity. So actually a lot of speakers of Chicano English may not even speak uh, English, excuse me, Spanish well. Um, so I'd like to play you a clip of uh, American Crime. Who's seen American Crime, the show? So it's a, a <laughs> so it's a, a popular series in uh, uh, Netflix, and it has Richard Cabral. So Richard Cabral is from East LA, and he speaks a uh, he speaks Chicano English. Okay. So I'd like to uh, ask you to point out any of the features in his dialect, which may be um, different from standard English, okay? So we're gonna listen for about a minute here. 
what's been your evolving characters? What, what, first of all, what, which one was your favorite? It's, um, I, I, I think it was, it was, it was Hector. It was Hector. And, and Hector, the yeah, black Hector. Yeah, that was nice. Because that, that was nice. So, okay, so let's see if I could let that charge for a second. All right, okay, so, um, scratch that. <laughs> so, um, basically, um, so in Chicano English we have some features like uh, what Richard was going to say would be like, like uh, I need to go to you do whatever. So you have like that ooh sound, right, for two. Um, sort of the rising intonation, like you're asking a question, but you're making a statement. Um, and all these f features are for uh, ethnic identity, right? It's, he doesn't really, actually Richard doesn't really speak Spanish very well. Uh, that was proven in a Univision interview, actually, shortly after that. <laughs> so, how does this relate to uh, Arabic? So, um, in Arabic, we, in, in, in just linguistics in general, as we know, um, a lot of factors that are going to affect uh, the way you pronounce things, the way that um, language is going to vary. So, some of the ways that, as we know, uh, track linguistic change is like age, you can see by cohort how uh, language is changing, biological sex, uh, social economic class. So these are all things that uh, affect language variation and change in uh, Western society and then also in the Arab world. So famous study, the Labav, the R, fullness, very similar studies in the Arab world. Um, nothing new. Uh, when we get to Arabic, um, we tend to think of ethnicity uh, on a little bit different terms. So um, we think of city or, or city or nation of origin, so that's like regional. They'd say that that's ethnic uh, variation. So there's one famous study by Atika Hashimi, who was actually at the University of Toronto, and she found that uh, some speakers that were from Fez that moved to uh, uh, Casablanca had left their uh, pronunciation of R to become R, like a tap, like a R, uh, because they were appropriating this new Casablancan um, identity. Another uh, way that we understand uh, language and change in the Arab world is language variation and change is through religion. So uh, there's a lot of religio lex in the Arab world. Uh, so for example, Blanc did a lot of studies on Baghdadi Arabic. There's Christian Baghdadi Arabic. There's uh, Muslim Baghdadi Arabic. There's also um, Judeo Baghdadi Arabic. And it all varies even within the sect. So there's a famous study by Clive Holes which talks about uh, Shia uh, Arabic in Bahrain versus uh, Sunni Arabic. And for example, the etymological J is realized as Y for one group and then J for another group. And it's all based off of uh, religion. So what religion do you ascribe to? And then there's even tribal affiliation. So when you look at, uh, you know, are you Bedouin? Do you identify as Bedouin or, 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 um, or not? So you can live in a city and have Bedouin-like features. Um, but when you talk about uh, ethnicity, so in the same way that you have uh, ethnic identity, like in Chicano English, like somebody that identifies as uh, Mexican-American, doesn't necessarily speak Spanish, but um, speaks their English with like a Spanish flavor, we don't uh, really have that in the Arab world. We don't tend to look at Arab society that way. We don't understand that way. Why? Because the common uh, understanding is that your, I, your language is, uh, your ethnic identity is linked to your mother tongue. So the idea is that if you are, for example, Kurdish, so here's a picture of some Kurds in Iraq, you're going to speak Kurdish but not Arabic with a Kurdish flavor or, or type of pronunciation or Kurdish-like features. Uh, the same is true for uh, Siwa, if we go back to Egypt. So Siwa is actually a Berber language. We don't think of uh, the, the Siwa people speaking uh, Arabic with a Siwi type of 
accent or flavor, we think of, oh, okay, the Berbers, or the, the Siwi speaks Siwi, uh, but that their Arabic, maybe they don't speak it at all. They don't speak uh, with an accent or anything like that. Uh, and the same goes for North Africa. So this is a, a Berber woman, a North African woman, who speaks uh, Berber in Algeria, and we don't think of, okay, this woman, uh, you know, we don't think of somebody that would speak um, Berber, or excuse me, Arabic with a Berber accent. We would say, oh, this person only speaks Berber, okay? So how does that relate to southern Egypt? So we're going to go talk about two different groups. There's the, the Nubians who speak, it's a traditionally spoken Nubian, it's now a Saharic language, and the Saidis who have always spoken Arabic. We're going to compare and see how their ethnic identity is uh, realized in the variation of their pronunciation of that one sound we talked about earlier. So moving on. So uh, I'd like to take a minute to look at some of these pictures. So on the top right, uh, there's during my field work myself with a couple of my Saidi informants. So uh, the man standing next to me wearing uh, some European likes clothes. The guy to the right wearing a gelabia, so it's a traditional um, Egyptian garment. A lot of Saidis wear that, and also the emma is part of it, so it's a, the, a, a turban is southern Egypt. My other Saidi consultant and friend wearing some uh, European street clothes. But anyway, Saidis, so who are they? The Saidis are the, uh, they claim lineage of, to the Arabs from the Arab, uh, Arab conquest, so from the 8th century to uh, present times, basically, they've lived in Egypt since uh, that time. So it's important to note that they're the most numerous and politically dominant group in the region. So they have access to all the resources. They um, pretty much hold all the political offices. And also, this group uh, exclusively identifies as Arab. So they wouldn't say uh, that they're anything else. Okay. The other group are the indigenous Africans. So the Nubians, as we were talking about earlier, the top left is uh, some, a picture of some young Nubians during my field work in uh, Elephantine Island, which is part of the traditional Nubian homeland. So uh, as I said earlier, they're part of, okay, so Nubia is, uh, the, the Nubians have been there basically for millennia since the time of the pharaohs. They, uh, their homeland is actually from this sixth hash mark on the Nile all the way up to Aswan, so from Sudan all the way to Aswan, um, as on along the Nile, that's their traditional homeland. Um, and their language is, now it's, well, the Nubian language, which they spoke, is a uh, now it's a Saharic language. It's not uh, Arabic. Um, it's endangered due to a lot of different reasons, so the iron-fisted policies from the Egyptian government, the education system. So the, uh, you know, basically you have to only speak Arabic in the school system. Also economic opportunity, so if you want to go speak, uh, if you want to have access to uh, any of the resources in southern Egypt with the Saidis or even in the Arab world, you have to speak Arabic. You, you, Nubian's not going to get you anywhere. Um, so that's a reason why a lot of the Nubians have shifted from uh, Nubian to Arabic as a mother tongue. And in the study, a lot of all my uh, young informants don't speak it at all. And what's important is that identity-wise, they, uh, they don't identify as Arab. They would say, I'm Nubian, I'm African. And that is uh, going to be a crux of how we look at how they speak Arabic. Is it uh, with a Nubian type of accent, or that's some of the questions that I'm going to be asking. OK. And it's also important to note that um, the Nubians are a, a stigmatized group in Egypt. One of the big uh, events that really affected the Nubians was the construction of the high dam. So a picture of the high dam right there in the bottom left corner, one of the modern marvels of uh, uh, modern architecture. So the idea was during Gamal Abdel Nasser's era in 1960s was to uh, stymie the flow of the Nile in order to make it more navigable, to uh, provide uh, electricity for a burgeoning population. And those, that was a good thing from it that did provide that. Uh, it also provided, um, you know, a lot of economic opportunities. So uh, steel mills sprouted up in southern Egypt because of it. The granite quarries were revitalized, and uh, there was actually fisheries and stuff uh, sprouted up because of the dam. However, it was at a large, 
human costs. So uh, Nubia, if you look at the Egyptian side, so this is all Nubia, right? When you build a big dam, it plugs up all that water. It created a man-made lake. It's called Lake Nasser, named after the, the late president, Kamal bin Nasser. This actually covered uh, the traditional Nubian homeland. And a lot of the Nubians were uh, forcibly moved from all these regions right here to uh, Aswan, to um, you know, all the way up to Luxor, basically. This region right here, not really compensated uh, at all. So even within southern Egypt, this group is uh, marginalized. OK. So the method, what did I do in order to uh, study this dialect, in order to study um, this group? So I was a participant observer, so I became a part of the community before I actually uh, did any research. So this is actually pictures of myself with some of my informants. There's a picture of me with a uh, Nubian fair, uh, motorboat a driver, because in order to get to uh, the Nubian Elephant Island, you have to take the little boat. It's about a two minute boat ride. Uh, this is me with one of my Saidi consultants at the University of Oslo, where I did some of my research too. And what I would do, or what I did, is I actually uh, provided free English lessons for the Nubians um, in Elfantine Island, became a part of the community. And when I was uh, going back and forth from Cairo to uh, Aswan, I was uh, a part of the English language club. So I would uh, basically practice English with all the interested students in, in English. And that was good because it uh, provided me with an opportunity to speak with people, low pressure, and then kind of listen to how they were talking. So that's how I identified different sounds uh, that, va that were variable, um, was through this process, being a part of the community. And um, I used, when I actually got to the social linguistic interviews, I um, used a Lebovian style interview. Uh, basically, uh, it had, the idea was to get them to talk in the vernacular as much as possible. So I would have them talk about different um, themes. So we would talk about how, you know, marriage. How, how, what do people do around here for marriage? What do people do for you know, childhood games, dream interpretation, uh, dangerous situations you've been in, with the idea that you're going to be listening the vernacular. What I didn't do was I didn't use reading tasks. And the reason why is, number one, is diglossia. So you're going to be uh, eliciting a different register. So you're going to have the vernacular here, and you're going to be eliciting uh, modern standard Arabic. Another reason why I didn't do that is because a lot of my uh, consultants were functionally illiterate, so I couldn't um, actually get a large number of people to participate that way. So that's the methodology I used for gathering the data. Um, research sites. So here I have the three sites I mentioned. So this one on the right is Aswan, the red dot, Elvetine Island, University of Aswan, six miles down. So what is like the areas that I did some of my recordings in? So this is actually, it's called a souk. It's an open air market. Um, it's a relatively quiet place in Aswan, not so much in big cities like Egypt, or not Egypt, uh, Cairo. Um, so, uh, in, you know, I would go meet with my friends, and I would, uh, a lot of the young to middle aged Saidis, and uh, do my recordings with them inside these little shops right here. So, quiet area, low uh, foot traffic. This is uh, Elmstein Island. Um, this is the traditional homeland of the Nubians, and uh, that's where I did a lot of my research with uh, the vast majority of the Nubian consultants in the study. Um, that's actually my apartment I stayed in, in the middle there, so uh, just became part of the community and uh, did my research there. And then the University of Aswan, so and this is uh, where I did it in classrooms, a lot of the uh, social linguistic interviews, and that was actually really important to get interviews with young women because as we know, Egypt is a, is a, especially southern Egypt, is a conservative society, so it made it uh, okay for me to go and conduct that research there. Okay, so my corpus. I have 30 hours of recorded speech, 33 consultants, and 22 of them were Saidi, uh, 11 of them were Nubian. I uh, used high quality microphones, I used uh, head mounted shear microphones and uh, solid state recorders for the uh, phonetic analysis. I control phonetic factors. I could talk about that more in the Q&A if you're interested. And again, we're interested in how your ethnic identity is going to affect the way you pronounce the sound at all. What's interesting is that um, 
my Saidi consultants actually had metalinguistic commentary about this. So the Saidis would say, Saidi bi al huruf. So the Saidi enlarges the letters for you. So what does that mean? It means they understand that, okay, we pronounce things differently than the other group, but we can't really quite put our finger on it. But they say, to go on, yifakham laka ta. So the Saidi makes this ta, this fringalized T emphatic. Okay, so he says, all right, we make it differently, but we don't know exactly how. Um, what's interesting is that the Nubians will say um, sort of similar comments about that. They'll say, kasar. So we speak broken Arabic. What does that mean? Okay, so that has uh, sort of internalized this, um, I guess, stigmatized status within their Arabic. Okay? And then specifically, they say, so the ta can turn into a t. So these are actually two separate sounds. Uh, they're two separate phonemes in Arabic, and they differ phonetically. Um, and you can actually measure that. So I'm going to uh, ask you to participate in a little uh, activity so that we can understand how these are different. Okay. So these actually differ by aspiration. So uh, if you will, I would like you to say, put your hand in front of your mouth and say still and tell a couple times. So still tell and then tell me what the difference is, what you feel. So still, tell, still, tell. All right. Awesome. So what did you guys see? What's the difference? Any of you linguists now? <laughs> tell me, tell me. Aspiration, yeah, absolutely. So aspiration, absolutely. So how does that relate to this comment that the Nubians made? So the Nubians said that uh, their ta, the ta, is a te, right? They pronounce it as a te. So, so in Arabic dialects, we know that ta is unaspirated. For in virtually every Arabic dialect, it's unaspirated. Whereas the te is an aspirated sound. So for those of us who aren't familiar with um, what this is, so remember the, the word till, right? It had that really long puff of air, right? We can actually measure that puff of air in, in uh, phonetics. So this right here is VOT. It's the length of that puff in milliseconds. So how long that puff is. So for the word, uh, sorry, excuse me, for the word till, we would get a long puff of air, right? So we get that really long puff of air. And for the word st uh, still, we would get a short puff of air, right? So that's what the difference is. Um, for the, the Nubians, basically, they're saying that their ta isn't like the Arabs' ta. They're saying that their ta has this really long puff of air, and they notice it. Um, so basically, they would ha we would project that their aspiration or their puff of air would be much longer, according to those metalinguistic comments, right? Um, so that's our hypothesis for this sound, how they vary according to ethnic identity, right? Okay. So you guys ready for the results? All right, let's do the results. Okay, so these are the results. Um, we have here, again, the VOT, uh, which is basically the, uh, again, the length of that puff. And here we have the Saidi group, and then we have the Nubian group over here. So the Saidi is the way they pronounce their ta. Their ta was about three milliseconds, give or take three, so it was basically unaspirated, very little, just like all other Arabic dialects, right? That's how we would expect it to be. They identify as Arab. Their pronunciation is Arab. Um, the Nubian on their head, they have 17 and a half milliseconds, give or take three. Okay, so they are pronouncing their ta with an increased, uh, you know, this increase of uh, puff of air, increased uh, aspiration. And why is that? Well, if you go look at Nubian grammars, uh, their stops are actually aspirated. So all their stops have this big puff of air. So it's like they're speaking Arabic with a Nubian accent, with a Nubian flavor, even though they don't actually speak Nubian anymore. Right? So this is purely for identity purposes, to uh, you know, assert who they are as African, not as, uh, as Arab. Right? So what does this tell us? Um, it kind of tells us it adds to how we understand um, 
Arab society, right? So we have all these other factors that we look at in Arab society. We know that language varies by age, speaker sex, all these different, uh, you know, religion, all these different variables, right? But it also um, shows that it's not necessarily a link between uh, the mother tongue and ethnic identity, right? So you can actually speak Arabic with like a, you know, a Nubian flavor or a Nubian type of accent, right? Um, so this is it, it, one of the additions to that. So it helps us understand a little bit more about how Arab society, uh, you, know, you know, how that is linked to your ethnic identity, how that can actually play out in the variation. Okay? So why does this matter? All right. So uh, basically what's interesting about this is that uh, language and society in, in Arabic dialects is uh, basically, or, or just in the Arab world, is a wide open field. I mean, we don't even know what a lot of dialects are. Um, we don't know how a lot of factors will play out that are common in, you know, Western society, like ethnicity as a variable. So it provides, there's a lot of opportunity to, um, you know, test this out, these factors out, to understand more about Arab society, language variation, and change in the Arab world. Um, one way we can continue that research right here in San Diego County would be to do a, uh, what I would call my second research project, which would be understanding how diaspora and ethnic identity, uh, how that affects uh, variation in the, it, it, right here in San Diego County. So um, I know a large, I know there's a large uh, Iraqi and Syrian population here in uh, North County, so in Ramona, in um, El Cajon, there's quite a bit of uh, Iraqi and Syrian diaspora there. Um, you can study how they view themselves uh, if they're uh, actually, if they view themselves as, okay, I'm Iraqi, or am I Syrian, or do they view themselves as uh, Arabs in America, right? So one way we could test that is by looking at the vowels, right? So we can look at um, the a vowel in, uh, as a variant. So if you go look at Iraqi Arabic, um, the aval, the etymological aval is realized as aw. So you would say the word door, it's bob, and that means door for Iraqi dialects. In Syrian dialects and Levantine dialects, sometimes you get things like bab, it's more fronted, um, and that means door. But what's interesting is that uh, as a, a native of Ramona and uh, as somebody that's part of the community, I noticed that a lot of my Iraqi friends, when they speak Arabic, will say things like bub, something in between. It's not necessarily, uh, you know, like this really back vowel. And, you know, uh, it'd be interesting to kind of test that, to measure it, um, and to understand why it's like that. So is it because they no, don't identify anymore as, okay, I'm part of the Iraqi community or I'm part of the Syrian community, perhaps I'm part of uh, the Arab community in America. So is that affecting kind of how they're, they're uh, portraying their identity uh, ethnically. Okay, and uh, this type of research would also be interesting because it would be an opportunity to conduct longitudinal research with these types of social linguistic interviews with interested uh, SSU faculty and SSU students. Um, so you can do these social linguistic uh, interviews with uh, basically students that are interested in conducting these interviews, they can participate in it, they can analyze the data, and um, you can use that to, uh, you know, inform social linguistic theory. So perhaps diaspora makes social linguistic rate of change super fast because maybe they're creating this new identity really quick. So that could add to social linguistic theory. Um, it's also uh, an ideal project to collaborate with because you can create these, corp these corpora, right, these dialect uh, or these recordings, right, of social linguistic interviews, you don't necessarily have to be interested in the linguistic data. So if you're interested in um, the actual content, so if you're interested in the, uh, I don't know, a oral history, or you're interested in uh, violence studies, you can talk about, uh, you know, dangerous situations. That's one of the themes in the, the social linguistic interview. You can actually write about the content. Um, as a, you know, if you're an interested faculty member, or even students that may, maybe aren't necessarily interested in linguistics, uh, students that are Arabic studies uh, majors in the department, or excuse me, in the, uh, the center. Okay? And what's interesting about this is that uh, 
this type of uh, you know on the ground research, field research can spur uh, future projects. So I learned painfully that when you do sociophonetics, you have to annotate the sounds by hand, right? It takes forever to measure sounds. Um, so there's actually equipment available. There's programs available in uh, like well-studied languages like English, like forced alignment, vowel extraction, and you can really speed up your uh, you know your research. You can do bigger data sets. Um, it would be interesting to uh, collaborate with faculty members that are interested in to create a tool to make that easier. And what's great about that is that if you're uh, you, that basically provides more opportunity for grant for grant opportunities. You could apply to uh, NSF, all sorts of other venues to fund that. And okay, I think I would like to uh, end with the sunset. That's one. And uh, I look forward to any questions you might have about the research. Thank you. Yes. Yes. That you mentioned, right, in the front or, or not front mm -hmm. the GD um, variation. So I'm curious about your choice of that in particular. Oh, the actual, the variable. Yeah, so, the yes, vowel. I actually did uh, all three of those sounds in my dissertation. So uh, the vowels um, for the Saides are more of a centralized vowel, so it's more like an uh for the Saides, and that's very prototypical of uh, Southern Egyptian Arabic, so it was no surprise there. But um, the uh, Nubians have more of a backed variant, so it's more like an awe um, for the, their aleph uh, vowels. And um, that's for both the emphatic and non emphatic context, so uh, that's for that. Um, there's a split for if you go look at Jim, so etymological J has uh, got all sorts of realizations in Egypt. It, in Cairo, it's realized as a ga. In, um, let's see, in southern Egypt, it can be realized four different ways. Actually, it can be realized as a ga, it can be realized as a da, it can be realized as a ja, and it can be realized as a gya, a palatal. And um, they, they all correspond to that, and they actually uh, correspond socially. So Saidis will tend to use this gya and uh, a da, whereas uh, the Nubians will stick with a uh, more of just a straight ja. Uh, it's actually ethnically patterned that way. As well. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, really quickly, what's the Nubian operating system like? Yes. So, the po okay, the stop system, okay, so the, if you're talking about aspiration in general, so uh, they don't have a, like PTK, they have T and K, and all those, uh, those, those uh, voiceless stops are aspirated in the uh, Canusian Nubian. Mm -hmm. uh, P, there's no P. It's, it's only an allophon. So, when it's like a B, that's the voice or something like that. Uh, say again? That's no problem. Yeah, well, actually, no problem for them in, in that dialect, which actually it's phonemic in, uh, uh, like, Iraqi Arabic, it's an actual phoneme by itself. Uh, P. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, go for a floor. Sure. So um, I actually became interested in it by, uh, I was, like I said, I was a student at uh, the American University of Cairo, and uh, 
in the Arab world, it's uh, thank God it's Thursday, right? So it's not thank God it's Friday. Every Thursday after uh, classes, I would just hop on the train down with my, my southern Egyptian friends and go, uh, you, know, be, you know, hang out in southern Egypt. So that's how um, I got interested. In, I mean, in time, okay, the actual time spent in southern Egypt was probably maybe about a month, but over, you know, a six-month period. So going back over the weekends, and then um, I stayed after my program uh, ended in, I think, May, and I stayed a couple months actually to conduct the first part of my field research. Then I got a grant to go back and uh, complete it for my dissertation. Mm -hmm. and um, my second question is about you, you, you sort of hinted at some of this as, as, as you were speaking at the beginning about the complexity of what it is to speak of an ethnicity. Yes. Okay. Yes. So contrasting that to other, uh, other variables such as yes. said, religious identification, yes. like that, etc. So, what makes Nubian an ethnicity, and what are other ethnicities that one could com compare it to in the region? So, you mentioned Kurds early on. Yes. Uh, well, I mean, I'll just say that, okay, so that, okay, so I, what I was saying is that basically that uh, the idea would be that, okay, you're Kurdish, so we don't, in the Arab world, we wouldn't understand you to speak Arabic with a Kurdish accent. You would just say, oh, you're Kurdish, you speak Kurdish. So that it was linked to your mother tongue. That's how uh, I was using that. And that's what I'm asking about, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm wondering whether there's anything, maybe, maybe there's a literature there, maybe there isn't, maybe that's just a potential comparative study. Uh, that, that, yes, I think that they, have a, they do have a similar situation. Um, I think they, they uh, basically, it would be kind of, a, you know, you're not allowed to speak Kurdish, you're not allowed to speak Nubian in school. It's like this way of asserting yourself, uh, you know, your identity as a Kurd, as a, um, as a Nubian in your language, right? So, um, Yes, it, it does get, when you get to, like, like you said, it does get to uh, encompass a lot of different things when you talk about ethnicity. So it's, you know, it's part, partly how you identify, you know, it can be, in, you know, religiously or however, you know, they call them communal ex in the field, um, as long as it's a community, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes, go for it, Aaron. Yes. Uh, so is that merged with the non emphatic key, or did they, did the component still remain based on some? Uh, yeah, so, okay, that's a good question. So I actually went back uh, and I measured the, the T, just the, just the straight T, and that actually has about uh, 35 milliseconds mean uh, VOT. So the aspiration is, is a little, the puff is a little longer just for the, the, the T sound, whereas it's um, phonetically a little bit less. So it's close to it, it's not 100%. It's like a, it's like a um, it's like a semi-merger, it's not all the way there, yeah. So there's a phonetic difference, like you said. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, go for it. Were you finding any differences in the different sort of situations that you were bringing up, especially, I, I don't know if those would be related to ethnic identity, like, like uh, you know, violent situations, for instance, how you deal with that, like, um, in different other settings? Sorry, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear your question. Uh, Oh, yes, uh, dangerous uh, situations prompts. in the prompts, yeah. Yeah. Um, were you seeing any effect of the actual prompt situation on the amount of emphasis in the uh, visualized school? Um, so, like the, okay, so maybe like the topic or the, the actual theme we're talking about is, is making them interacting with the phonetic realization. So, um, I did like run that for stats and it didn't uh, when I was fixing the models it wasn't it didn't run, come up as significant and um, but yeah that's that's a, a good point is that that thing those type of themes could uh, affect the data yeah yeah I was just curious especially since this I had mentioned that was something that you know, we were calling in large emphatic 
Yeah. Yeah, but okay, that's interesting too because that okay, so that that word is it has multiple meanings. You call tafkhim is actually a grammatical term too. It's um, it's uh, a okay, so you have a a process. It's called emphasis, where you um, basically it changes the vowels in the sentence too. So it could have something to do with that too. Um, it, okay, so basically, if you have like a, a fr any pharyngeal consonant, it'll back and lower the vowels, and then uh, maybe that could basically have something to do with the actual segment too of the the ta. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was wondering, um, you had mentioned that the Kurdic people do not do that, that they do not identify in a linguistic way when speaking Arabic. Um, I was uh, interested in finding out whether there is a correlation of uh, maybe social pressure on that because the Kurds are not very popular in, in uh, their area. So why would they? That's an interesting point you make. So um, they uh, actually, in both situations, they both want to form separate nations. So they're trying to create this identity. So in in like Iraq, Syria, they're trying to form a Kurdistan, right? So they're, it's you know basically proud to be Kurd, at least from uh, some of my Kurdish friends and uh, and consultants that I've worked with. And for the Nubians, there's been a push actually for a reformation of the Nubian state. It's actually been pushed uh, for the, you know, to the Sudanese government as well uh, to f you basically take that land that straddles southern uh, Egypt and northern Sudan. So um, there's pride in that from that aspect. Mm -hmm. uh, go for it. Yeah. Um, kind of in smaller resources. There's sort of a question about whether there's any point in talking about, let's say, religion variables or sect variables, right? And linguistic variables, right? So is there anything that, so we know that there are places where um, Shiite speakers might be speaking distinct, distinct forms of Arabic from Sunni speakers, but is that going to carry over to other regions farther away? That, that, see, that's, so yeah. Okay, so yeah, typologically within Arabic, um, no, there's there's not. It's always within like little Sprachen zone, like little areas. So like it's within um, like Bahrain, for example. It's just those two groups tend to uh, deseg they, they segregate. They live like separate from one another, and that's part. Of, and the same thing in um, Iraq. Actually, there's uh, Hit has that too for the there's Judeo Hit Arabic, which is kind of random. It's a small town in Al Anbar province, and then it's similar in Baghdad, but it's not necessarily. Uh, Pan, it's not type of like, like over Arabic dialects. So if you look at Egypt, for example, you don't you don't think of oh this is Coptic Christian Arabic, right? There's just lexical differences. So that's uh, it's not like a, a, a typological difference if that's what you're getting at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess so your your kind of your fundamental unit of analysis is the linguistic community. Yes. And there are all these social forces creating everything. Yes. That's that's you know that's even a good question. So if you go look at the socioeconomic class variable, that's something that is not well understood in the Arab world either. So like in um, you know most of the studies in uh, Western society, like we've studied English, we have the socioeconomic class var uh, excuse me the uh, index right. So it's got all these things. It's got your education, your how much money you make, where you live, your zip code, all that stuff. Uh, that we, we tried to actually Rani Habib at Syracuse tried to apply that in several communities in the Arab world and found that, well, this doesn't work. Basically, you're either rich or you're poor, and that's it. Um, so we still have a lot to understand about how uh, Arab society functions you know, as a whole. Um, we don't have actually a so socioeconomic class variable. So some people get around that by uh, you know, various methods, but we don't, have, uh, we don't know a lot, actually. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it.
Yes, you said that right. Um, so <laughs> um, that's that is a, that's something that I think could be the case. I didn't check for that, but it's something that would be a, definitely a follow-up situation uh, for that. So I mean, it's uh, basically this came from you know field work. I didn't even know anything about the dialect at that time. Uh, so yes, you're right. That probably has something to do with it. Um, yeah, some of those things too, like uh, just looking at uh, what they mean indexicality-wise. Like some speakers, there was I thought that maybe there was a speaker effect for a couple of the CITES that, um, or excuse me, a couple of the Nubians that um, would produce their ta with less aspiration, and um, a lot of that. If you go and I actually talked, this actually probably has to do with what you're talking about. Um, when I talked with them. They would say, "Oh, um, you know, we pronounce this like the Saides with this less aspiration because um, we want to be tough." And for them, it was kind of like that's what they viewed the Saides as these tough guys. So it was like the second order indexicality for them. Um, that's uh, uh, how I understood it from my informants because one of them was like a, a security guard, another guy was like a bouncer type guy, and he was a Nubian. So it was, yes, the, the, to answer your question, but uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, okay, so for this particular sound, when I was uh, going and doing the stats, uh, speaker sex or biological sex wasn't a significant factor, but um, for other sounds it was. Uh, so like for that uh, etymological J, uh, it, was, uh, it was significant uh, for that. So like the females would produce uh, this J sound as like a J. Uh, it would be realized as a J for the... Um, the females, whereas for the men, they would say it as like a gya or perhaps even like a d. It, there's a, quite a bit of a dialectal variation for that. Um, so, like if you go look at the consonal system in Arabic, it's very rich. So, uh, there's been even people that have proposed chain shifts in the consonants. Like, you know, in English or Germanic languages, we have the chain shifts of vowels, but uh, in Arabic, we have many, many consonants. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in Arabic for Sur linguistics. Mm -hmm. So um, what are current areas of um, study in Arabic for Sur linguistics? So what's being done and like how is the field that subfield moving? Um, so there's uh, some interesting work by a couple of colleagues of mine that do um, Palestinian Arabic uh, that do, you know, they look at uh, um, basically it's like small corpora where people are looking at uh, different effects, so it's uh, kind of uh, similar in the sense of what I was talking about earlier, like city of origin, so like they look at like, okay, this person is from Yaffa and now they live someplace else, how are they, how is the dialect changing? Uh, usually uh, very small studies in uh, the field of social linguistics in Arabic. Um, I would like to move it in the direction that general linguistics is going sort of with bigger data, uh, creating larger corpora, creating uh, tools like FAVE to help uh, push that along um, in order to uh, basically understand the first and foremost in social linguistics, the socioeconomic class. So that would be uh, something that um, I think would be a good uh, movement towards in the field. Um, and there's people that are moving towards it, like myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, a lot, that's where actually where most of the uh, gender is where you see most of the uh, studies for actually the most well studied sound is the cough. So it's, um, this is a variable. So uh, the uvular ka uh, can be realized in Arabic dialects as a uh, glottal stop. So it could be a a uh, or it could be a ka. Um, and in a lot of studies it's been replicated several times. It's, uh, or it could be a ga too, actually. Uh, the, the female speakers will tend to gravitate towards this uh sound, right? because it's uh, considered more feminine, more, more stylish, uh, whereas in a lot of other uh, places, they'll say, well, for the men, they'll say, no, this is harsh, this is the ga, this is a you know, lowbrow type of pronunciation. And that's been um, replicated over and over again by, in several different regions of, of the Arab world. Mm -hmm. So gender is very, uh, very well studied in that aspect. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thank you.